one of my most memorable childhood adventures was a day in 1978 when my very first kindergarten friend named Mark and I we bicycled down to a construction site building a new community swimming pool. And um, Mark and I would ditch our bikes and we're exploring this scene and we shimmied down this long plank, it's like a ramp, down into this freshly dug 15 foot deep swimming pool bowl, community size. And I don't really remember how long we were down in that hole because my memory is totally eclipsed by the arrival of the Broken Arrow Police Department. I <laughs> remember looking up this officer, mirrored glasses, probably a machine gun. He looked down over this hole and he says, you guys get out of that hole. Super dangerous down there. Did. Shimming back up that plank down on our bicycles, and Mark and I pedaled home, and I shook the whole way. And I remember what was ruminating in my head. I mean, we were nice kids, we were kindergartners, we were nice kids, and we were in trouble with the law. <laughs> And I remember pedaling, saying, <laughs> probably snuffing all along the way. I so wish I didn't go in that hole. The police are coming to my house. I'm going to jail. My life is over. I really thought that was reality. I didn't want to ever see another swimming pool for a hole again. So full of regret. Now that is the closest thing to trauma that I experienced up to that point in my life. But in the 45 years since that day, I have experienced countless traumatic days down deep in a hole. Of course, I'm speaking of figurative, not literal holes in this case, but holes every bit as anxious, every bit as deep, every bit as full of anxiety. Turn your Bibles, if you would, back to Psalm, or to Psalm chapter 1, Psalm number 130. <laughs> They finally found me. <laughs> it's so interesting that when I thought about that for a second, it created a visceral response. Just a little bit. I was like, oh, don't be silly. Mm. So our scripture today comes from that hole. Precisely that hole is where this author writes today, and I would like us to read this responsibly. You see the words on the screen, let's read it like this. I'll read the plain parts, you read the bold parts. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. It's great power. The depths is how this starts. The depths, out of the depths, 
I cried to you, O Lord, hear my voice, and I would add two or three exclamation points if my seven-year-old self tells me anything about the severity of that cry. Now, I don't think you have to be a poet or a theologian to interpret what we're talking about here with depths. My own depths have been more connected to relationship and emotion and even spiritual depths than it has been biological or physical depths, though I did have a five-year deep health hold that I spent. Most of the depths that I've experienced have not been physical. We know about these depths, don't we? It's in a generic metaphor for existential trouble. When we hear deep or deeping, deepening used a lot on the news, the news tells us about a deepening recession, or we hear about a deepening crisis or a deepening conflict somewhere in the world. We know that therapists, they see folks that are deeply depressed. And you and I all likely know too well what it is to feel down or to be down in the dumps or to not feel up for something, perhaps the Christmas season. <laughs> you know about the depths, don't you? You should know what this guy's talking about. It's a woman, I know. Out of the depths is where this comes from. Now, uh, interestingly, I think the Bible talks a lot more about life in the depths than many of us may think. I think if uh, you look closely to Jeremiah, I think he spent his entire professional vocation in the depths. You just read his journal, it's called Lamentations. Or King David. I read King David as spending maybe half his adult life in something like a depression or a fall. If you just read his Psalms, you balance them out, you'll see how much time he was in the fiery bog, the pit, bones aching with dryness. You just read this. I think even in the New Testament, I think that probably Peter and certainly Judas and maybe Thomas all knew a lot of things about living in the depths from time to time. I think it's true. Now, I would love to say that my sermon title today is A Quick Fix to Life in the Depths. But I find very little scriptural evidence and no life experience that suggests that that's how the depths work. There isn't a quick fix to life in the depths. But I do think there are wise ways to navigate the depths that are inevitable as part of the human experience. And I think Psalm 130 gives us some of that wisdom. So I'd like us to look here at these, um, this text. Now, um, I know there's a little bit of a stigma, maybe a lot of a stigma, or at least there used to be, connected to the times when we are in seasons of being in the depths. We were even afraid to admit it. Maybe church would be the last place we would ever admit it, or identify it, or, or even acknowledge it maybe, as if there's something wrong with that. And I just invite us today to challenge that stigma a bit. Because there's lots of voice in the Scripture for you and me when we find ourselves in those places. And I suggest today that life in the depths is not something to be skipped over or taken lightly. In fact, the Latin term for the opening phrase of this psalm is de profundis. From the depth, something profound is there in the depths of this. So let's look and see. So here instead today, um, the title of my sermon is Four Laws from the Whole. Laws for the Whole, we might call it. And so law number one when you find yourself down in the hole is to stop digging. I think it's Will Rogers who gets the credit for saying the first thing to do when you find yourself in a hole is stop digging. Now, I think this is much needed advice. 
that is often completely ignored when we get down in the hole. We get into a hole and depth begets more depth and that depth begets more depth and soon it's just a tailspin into the blackness of nowhereness. And I see that happening in two different ways mostly. One is when we're in the hole, we do dumb stuff. Don't we? We eat too much, we drink too much, we don't sleep right, we quit communicating with each other, we isolate, we stop praying, we may cut ourselves off completely from humanity, and I promise that is not a successful strategy when you're down in the hole, at least not for long. And yet it seems like that was like the whole human project during pandemic. It's a whole diet of dumb stuff we just kept doing. Some of us seem to be kind of stuck there a little bit. That's not a criticism, it's just maybe an invitation to acknowledge that the things we do when we're in the hole can often be counterproductive. In fact, I think while we quit doing all the things that might lead towards health, we actually overindulge in pacifying ourselves with counterproductive initiatives. How many of you, when you're down, have spent an extra four or five hours on social media? It is a reliably counterproductive endeavor. How many of you have been in a relational hole with somebody, in you know, a conflict with somebody you love? And when you're in that space, you just keep digging deeper and deeper. You just keep doing dumb stuff when you're in the hole. So I thought if that's ever been your problem, here are five big shovels to avoid when you're in the hole. Number one, when you're in the hole, well, here's if you want to, maybe you want to dig it deeper. Just raise your voice when you're in the hole with somebody. You know, because we all think best when we're being screamed at, don't we? Or when we're screaming. Another one, yeah, uh, use a lot of you statements. Make sure you make the problem their problem and not the problem. You know, that does two things. One, it prevents you from actually addressing the problem and it creates defensiveness in the other person. It's like a dual bonus. That shovel is a wide shovel. You statements. Or say, calm down. There, there, honey. You're much too upset about this thing. How effective is that? I remember I did something like that once. Or you can make sure that you're the one that gets the last word. It's pretty, pretty good safety. Or just get sarcastic. Dumb stuff. We do dumb stuff when we're in the hole. The number one law is to stop digging. But there's a way that the dumb stuff can compound. And this is the way I see that's really tragic and kind of almost under the radar. And that is... We often pile shame on top of our regret. So we've done something wrong and we feel kind of bad about it. We may have regret. That is the human condition. Feeling guilty is not bad. It can be healthy. But it's when we drizzle a big quart of shame on top of it, that's where things get off. Because we end up conjuring up this other notion that we are bad because we did something wrong and suddenly you've got a double mess that's just unnecessarily deep. We talked a couple of times in Lent about how shame is not one of God's tools. It's something that we do. Now, if the shame is an issue for you, Brene Brown has done some really, really great work around shame. You have to check out her stuff. Number one, number one rule of the hole is stop digging. Number two rule while you're in the hole is don't dig a hole for other people. I find the maxim to be true that misery loves company. But... I think the proverbial wisdom here prevails. Whoever digs a deep trap for others will fall into it him or herself. Whoever tries to roll a boulder over others will be crushed by it. You ever read the story of Esther? Remember the character Haman? Remember the trap he set and experienced? Great reminder. Sometimes when we're in the hole, we just seem to want to get others down in there with us. Now, dragging others down a hole will never elevate you, but it might decommission or drive away a person who could and might want to help you get out of the hole in the first place. Don't get others down in the hole with you. Not helpful. Law number three, while you're down in the hole, this is where it starts to get pretty good. Number three, cry to the Lord for help. Out of the depths, I cry to you. Now, I'm just saying, this Sultan, he has a very specific audience in mind that he's crying to. 
This is never the generic God higher power that's often uh, written as Elohim in the Hebrew. This psalm uses Yahweh and Adonai. In fact, eight times in six verses. Fourteen times it's refer he's referred to this one particular God. This is a God who the Psalter knows this God's name. This isn't some generic force, some higher power, just a generic God out there. This is the God, the Lord. Uh, Yahweh in Hebrew is often all caps, L-O-R-D, O-R-D being small. And Adonai, in this case, is just L-O-R-D, written in usual kind of English format. But in Hebrew, it's always a very specific God that this Psalter is crying out to. It's a God whose name he knows. I'm familiar here about this God. And I wonder if you might be able to answer this question, why is it that the person down the hole cries to that specific God, the Lord? Can we get our answer in verse 3 and 4? Because I think he knows that this God is not an iniquity accountant. Let's read it together, actually, shall we? If you, O Lord should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. This is a God who isn't an iniquity accountant or a forensic detective looking for evidence to file charges against you. This is a God who works the other direction. This is a God who longs to free you from the things that are burdening you. I've been wondering... If part of my trauma as a seven-year-old had to do with flawed ideas about the Broken Arrow Police Department in 1971. You see, I thought that that policeman just relished catching us in that pit. I thought he couldn't wait to throw the book at us and put us in jail and end our lives. I thought that his goal was met when he found some kindergartners down in that hole and that he could report to all his buddies, I busted those kids like crazy. But that flawed idea is part of what led me, I think, to being so traumatized by this. The fact is, that policeman didn't even come to my house to tell my parents. He pried us out of the hole, saving us from our own self-inflicted stupidity and let us go about our way. That was the policeman's desire. And my question for us, is God as well-intentioned as a 1978 police officer? Is your God as nice as a police officer? Because the God that this Psalter is crying out to here is that kind of God. So we have a little quiz here to check about your God. I'm going to give you three questions. I want you to just check and see if you know the answers to describe the God that we're all here today, presumably, to be in touch with. Question number one. It's just a little fill in the blank. See if you can fill in the blank. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be... Oh, very well done, class. Let's see how you do on question number two. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. We should be called children of God, and that is what we are. That's two for two. Or three for three, maybe. Let's go to question number three. The thief, Jesus says, comes only to steal and kill and destroy and put you in jail. I came that they may have and have it. Now, if this God, the God of the Bible, is the God that you're interested in, that God is nicer than a police officer in 1970. That God wants for you to get out of the hole, not because it's bad or you're wrong, but because you could get hurt. Prize us out of those places. At least that's what this psalm writer thinks. Law number three to review is that when we are in the depths, I pray that we might remember to call on this lavish lover God who doesn't want to condemn us. It's not part of God's desire to condemn us. Instead, wants to love us as children. How many of you who've had children really enjoy the times where you got to make your child's life a little better? I sure do. And I bet God's nicer than me. 
have abundant life. That's the Lord. That's the one. That's why. That's the Lord that this psalmist is crying out to. Which leads me to rule number four or law number four of life in the whole is to wait and to wait with hope. And I think this is the hardest one. I saved it for last. I think this is the hardest thing to do when we're down in the pit. You know? I think it's much easier, at least for me, uh, it's much easier for me uh, to just kind of flit and jitter to try to find relief as fast as I can rather than waiting. Flit and jitter. I think Jesus calls it oil and spin. Or another thing I think that's easier, and I see this happen sometimes, is that is um, we can wait, but we have no hope. And we just kind of find ourselves um, resigned. We're just like in a place of resignation. Well, nothing's ever going to be better about this. This is terrible. Or maybe dissociation. Actually. And disconnect from it. We just... And I will tell you, friends, I think that's where the miry bog concretizes around your feet. Is when we either can't wait or we can't hope. And that's where we're in trouble. That's so where we get stuck. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. I, I heard the Psalter say it over and over again. I wait. I wait like a watchman waiting for the morning. I wait. I wait. There was a lot of danger affiliated with that job of watching for the night. There's just lots of boogeymen out there, monsters for real. And there was a real celebration when that light came. And there was a reminder. I hear my mind. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the Lord. I'm waiting for the Lord with hope. I think that's the final. There, we wait with hope. Now, why? Well, I think the Psalter knows some things about God. And if you and I were Catholic, or Episcopalian, or Lutheran, or maybe Presbyterian, we would have already been introduced to some other texts today that come along with the lectionary that all of our Catholic cousins have already read this morning. And these other texts are texts that directly point out the kind of God God is. And I think this Psalter knew what kind of God this God is. It was the kind of God that this God is that gave this Psalter the capacity to wait with hope because he knew that even though he was in the pit for the moment and he was overwhelmed with anxiety or despair, the kind of God that God is is the kind of God that Ezekiel knew about. Ezekiel is one of today's lectionary texts. In Ezekiel chapter 37, you may know the story of a valley full of dried bones. And God says that uh, these bones represent all God's people. They're in the time of Babylonian exile. It's a great metaphor, a great image of what humanity is like when society has ended and there's nothing left. But God says to Ezekiel, these bones, they are the whole people of God. And they cry, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are cut off completely. It's a cry from the total societal devastation. You know what God says to Ezekiel? He says, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. God does suddenly there are new connections and then there's new strength and then there's new vitality and God puts God's breath back in to those devastated dried bones that represent God's people. That's the kind of God the Psalter's crying to. This Psalter knew that story about the way God is. That's the kind of God. In the New Testament, today we would have read from John chapter 11. It's the story of Lazarus. You know the story, don't you? Lazarus, if you don't know the story, Lazarus and Mary and Martha are some of Jesus' best friends. They live in a place called Bethany, and Lazarus becomes really ill, in fact, terminally so. And Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, hey, please come help our brother Lazarus. He's really sick. And what happens? And Lazarus dies. But there are a couple of things about this story that I think are really important for us to notice. They're peculiar, and I don't totally get them. But I think it's really important for us to take note. The first thing is that when I think about waiting with hope, why would I do that? Well, because I see in this story that sometimes God's design is that there's waiting. Oh. See, when Mary and Martha called, Lazarus was really sick, and they wanted more than anything for Jesus to come. And the Scripture tells us that Jesus didn't come. I don't really get that. I don't really understand why. 
But it seems consistent with my own life experience. What about you? How many of you have suffered longer than you want to? It's pretty consistent with the story here. Jesus waits. He doesn't go right away. There's a second interesting point, and that is that in the story it says that Jesus cries. I don't really get that. He had the power to fix it, right? He had the power to change it. And yet instead, he stayed in the story in a way that was deeply moved, deeply impacted, groaning within himself is what some translators Jesus waits and then he cries. And this, I think, is the God that the Psalter suggests crying out to. The God who waits sometimes. The God who even cries with us. If I had more time, I would visit the story in Exodus 32 where Moses prays like the Dickens that God would save his people from devastation. And he prays and he wrestles with God and he wrestles with God. And you know what God does? God changes God's mind. Right there, Exodus 32, you check it. God regretted something like that? He may hard in Hebrew. God responded to the prayer of Moses and did something different to bring about a new vitality that wasn't going to be there before. I don't have time to talk about that. But that's the God we're crying out to. That's the God that we're waiting upon. That's the God that we can wait upon with hope. So let's end this a little pastoral note from the Apostle Paul. He writes to his friends at Rome after he'd lived a long time. He'd gone from being a religious zealot and a persecutor of people and throwing them in jail or stoning them to getting knocked on his backside and being very vulnerable and needing the help of Ananias to come back and be able to see this new possibility, the possibility of mercy and hope and new aliveness and a kind of aliveness that even transcends death. And he writes to his friends at Rome, knowing that they would have similar life experiences. They would have visited the hole or the pit from time to time. And I think Paul wrote to the Romans something like this pastoral care note. And I think sometimes we hear it as like a stringent condemnation, but I don't hear it that way at all. I hear it as like, hey guys, remember this. Remember this good news about this God that I've discovered late in my life. And he says this, to set the mind on, actually, on the flesh like just life and what you see or hear, is death. But to set the mind on the spirit, the transcendent thing that goes where it wants, there's life and peace there. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells within you. I love those words from that old man, Paul, who had lived through many holes and lots of depths. He writes a note to his friends. Hey, it's not just your flesh. There's more going on in you. And what's going on in you is the same thing that was going on in dead Jesus in the tomb, bringing a new kind of aliveness that you had. Ooh, it's pretty good, yeah? So I think that's why the Psalter concludes his song with this the last verse, I think, and I'm going to try to carry this because you know what? I'm guessing that I have not visited my last hole quite yet. I hope you have. But as long as Mondays keep coming, there's a good chance I'll experience depression every week. But what I'm going to try to do from here is to hold on to this thing that I think the Psalter gives us. And it's this reminder with an exclamation point that there is hope in the Lord. And with the Lord, there is steadfast love and there is great power to redeem. I pray, maybe you, if you think there's a hole ahead for you, maybe you could have this verse too. I'll share it with all. If you think there's a hole ahead, have this verse too. You better stop. You better stop.
his life, I predict it will be in the next 10 years. Maybe in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> but I want him to know that um, he's not alone. He's not going to need to drag me down in the hole with him. I'm just going to try to be a reminder that the Lord who gives life has given life to me. And maybe if you can't see it, just look at me for a minute. And then you're probably overwhelmed by despair when you're down in that hole. But just look at me for a minute. Just look for a minute. Because I'm holding on to this notion. The Lord knows you're down there. In fact, I think the Lord's down there with you cry, maybe. Look up. Yeah, let's pray together, shall we? And I'm so thankful for my brother here. And that he's willing to let me stand beside him. Next time he's down the hole. In the depths. I don't pretend to know and I don't need to understand why he's there. Because I trust that you understand. And you know why. More importantly, I trust that you long to help them transcend the darkness of these depths and find the new kind of aliveness that you keep trying to show humanity over and over and over and finally did so with an exclamation point in the resurrection of Jesus. And I pray that we might keep our eyes on you, O oh Lord. We might see the gospel. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.